about this much. So uh, good morning to everyone uh, in the audience here at Simon Institute and uh, on Zoom. And uh, this is a welcome to the theoretically speaking lecture in science on cause and effect from deep learning to deep understanding by Julia Carroll, who oh, the mic, sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, welcome to Judah Pearl, who's going to talk about the science of cause and effect from deep learning to deep understanding. And we are extremely lucky to have Judah join us today, even if remotely. Uh, I guess I want to give you some instructions before we get started. Um, because it's a hybrid event, I, people uh, who are in Zoom uh, should type uh, answers in the Q&A. People in the auditorium can essentially raise their hand when there's a question and answer period. Or I, I believe that if you just speak up, if there's something unclear, Judah probably won't mind. And um, um, I am Shafi Goldwasser. I'm the director of the Institute, and which is an international venue for collaborative research in theoretical computer science and uh, fields, uh, joining fields. And we were established in 2012 from a very generous grant from the Simons Foundation. We bring together people from uh, computer science, from, mathem from mathematics, from engineering, from biology, physics, um, uh, neuroscience, and, and more to really explore the use of algorithmic thinking in science and in engineering. And uh, as you know, this has become more and more relevant over the last decade. And uh, one of our explicit goals is actually to expand the horizons of the field by exploring uh, scientific disciplines through what we call the algorithmic lens. And today's lecture is part of our uh, theoretically speaking series, which highlights very exciting scientific fundamental and computational advances for uh, a public audience. And uh, Judah is the Chancellor Professor of Computer Science and Statistics at UCLA, just down the coast, where he directs the Cognitive System of Laboratory and conducts research in artificial intelligence, human cognition, and philosophy of science. He has authored several uh, books, uh, among them Heuristics in 1984, Probabilistic Reasoning in Intelligence and Systems in 1988, and Causality. 2000-2009, which won the London School of Economics Lakatos Award for 2001. And more recently, he co-authored causal, uh, causal Inference in Statistics, um, and uh, which brings causal analysis to general audiences. Uh, Pearl is a member of National Academy of Science, National Academy of Engineering, and a fellow of Cognitive Science Society, Royal Statistical Society and the Association for Artificial Intelligence, Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. And in 2011, he won the Turing Award for Fundamental Contributions to Artificial Intelligence throughout the development of a calculus for probabilistic and causal reasoning. And in 2022, he, wrote, he won the BBVA Award, uh, Foundation Frontiers of Knowledge Award for laying the foundations of modern artificial intelligence so computer systems can process uncertainty and relate causes to effect. And he's particular, this talk is particularly uh, relevant to our semester because we have a semester right now at Simons on causality and learning. And there are many, many visitors whose, I think, careers and uh, professional interests were affected directly from uh, Yuda or Judah Perel's results. So um, I'm going to pass you the mic uh, or uh, virtually, Yuda, and welcome. And please, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Shafi, for introducing me. It's a pleasure for me to address the Simon Institute again. Last time I visited you, it was in 2013, I believe, nine years ago. And uh, the setup was a bit different. Uh, I talked in your auditorium and I had, uh, it wasn't on Zoom, I remember vividly Dick Carr being in the first row and Papa Demetrius, but <clears throat> we will get used to the Zoom media. Okay, my last, um, last time I talked here, my title was uh, Causal Reasoning or Causal Inference. This time I elevated here to a level of a science with something which I discovered recently. We are sitting on a science, not just a bunch of algorithm. And that is what I will try to uh, convey to you today. And I'm gonna do it in a context which is uh, quite uh, 
<clears throat> hot in the discussions today, it's the tension that takes place in data science between the data and the science. Namely, the difference between deep learning and what I call deep understanding. And I would like to convince you <clears throat> that we have today the computational facilities to model what we normally call deep understanding. My agenda will be outlined here. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about the reason that gives me the audacity to call this venture a science. And I'm talking about what makes uh, science a science. And here I'm gonna, within this uh, paradigm, I'm gonna talk about the two fundamental laws of causal inference. CI will be my symbol for causal inference. There I'm going to show you a ladder of causation, which is a hierarchy of reasoning, which came out of these two fundamental laws and which some people call the DNA of uh, reasoning. Within that <clears throat> ladder, we will find a do calculus, which is an algebra of interventions, which is a working horse of many of the applications which I'm going to discuss in number two. And what will be the applications? The application will tell us <clears throat> what the new science can add to AI. Three bullets. One is combining data with prior causal knowledge. It looks uh, reasonable, but it has faced a lot of uh, difficulties to combine data with prior knowledge, prior scientific knowledge primarily. And second will be seven pillars of causal wisdom. I call them pillars. And uh, <clears throat> what they are are tasks that can be accomplished today and that we couldn't uh, accomplish uh, until um, two decades ago. Okay. So it gives me a sense of accomplishment and a sense of joy. We can do things today that we couldn't do yesterday. And that is uh, the fun of doing science. Uh, then I'll talk about two horizons, which I believe will be the directions that causal inference will take in the future. It's just barely sketched now. One is personalized decision-making. The other one will be social intelligence. Okay, we have the agenda and now it is my obligation to fulfill all my promises. <clears throat> I'm going to go to a data science domain and tell you about the clash, a real clash. It's high, highly hot confrontation between two aspects of this uh, data science. One is the data and the other one is the science. Well, in the scientific paradigm, uh, we have up, what am I doing here? Here we are. The scientific paradigm is characterized by two notions. Number one, a world Number two, a question about the world. Namely, we ask ourselves, what should the world be like before we can answer a research question? But the research question is not about the data, it's about the world. So these two notions will be missing in the alternative paradigm, which is uh, I call data-centric paradigm. <clears throat> well, there is no such notion as a world outside the data. And our task is to fit the data as well as we can, so as to, ma to maximize some measure of success measured on what? On the training set, on the data itself. Because since there is no um, uh, model of 
external to the data, all we can do is to try our success on the data. And this is our measure of success. And this is constitute um, a measure of performance. Okay. Now, oh, yeah. okay. let me now go deeper in what I mean by a scientific paradigm. Yeah. Especially when we talk about understanding. Our focus will be the notion of understanding. Under what condition we can say the system understands. When we look at what we people mean by understanding. <clears throat> One important characteristic that should not be underestimated is the sensation of being in control. <clears throat> it's one of the most powerful force that drive behavior for human being and for children. Uh, my, my <laughs> even psychologists or uh, psychological um, therapeutic uh, clinical uh, psychologists will vow to you that the drive to be in control is immense. For instance, battered wife fall into the illusion that it's their fault and they're trying to improve their behavior and uh, please their abuser more and more just for the sake of being in control. They cannot change the behavior of the abuser, so they change themselves in order to feel in control, to make a difference, to have the uh, illusion that they're improving, that they're doing everything that they can in order to improve the situation. So I'm, I'm, we're not going to focus much on this psychology of uh, battered wife and children, uh, but we are going to go into formalizing that notion of being in control. What can we expect from a person who <clears throat> feels in control? Number one, we want that person or that machine to be able to predict future events from past observation. Okay. You are uh, watching, uh, say, you are watching uh, a thousand by thousand um, screen of pixels, and you are trying to predict the label that is attached to that, uh, the interpretation of the screen whether it is a tiger or a cat. Okay. That's a, a highly complex example of predicting one event or one label from past observation. Okay. Um, then you want to predict the consequence of actions. Actions by definition are something that make a change in the world. And you turn the light switch on and, and you expect to see uh, light in the room. <clears throat> the child rattled the play and expect to find the sound of the rattling. Okay. <clears throat> so predicting the consequence of contemplating action. Next level, you would like to provide, oh, I, he who is in control, could provide explanation for unanticipated events. If you turn the switch on and the light does not come on, then you try to, you need to explain, or we expect that understander to explain whether it is uh, a burned light bulb or perhaps a power surge in the network and, and to be able to repair it. And the reason we want to find explanation is to repair and get things uh, under, uh, uh, back to normal. Fourth is a measured alternative world or also called roads not taken. For instance, we can say, what if uh, 
Cleopatra did not have the kind of beauty she possessed, how would history of Western world change? I'm, I'm going from history to something more uh, um, banal. What if I, I didn't do what I actually did? What if I acted differently? So I, I imagine roads not taken and reason about them. Why? Because of that ability to imagine, imagine gives me also the power to form new theory and to discover new ways of handling things. So this is the kind of level we are going to talk about. We want to be able to implement on a machine in order to qualify for the title understanding. The fifth one, which is still in the, on the uh, laboratory uh, bench, are uh, ideas of uh, conducting new experiments, seek new observation. These all follow from number four. And I want to focus on the uh, idea of curiosity because this is an element to which we find in human being, not so much in uh, uh, lower level animals, although some people tell me that the uh, raven have some capability uh, in, of, of curiosity. What we mean by curiosity? Curiosity is a, a restlessness that a child exhibits <clears throat> when the child is learning a new phenomena. For instance, why one toy rattles and the other one does not. And the discovery is that one has a moving ball, the other one does not have a moving ball. Now, the, the interesting thing is that children, when they learn by uh, playful manipulation, uh, children <clears throat> are restless, even if they do not receive any award, even in a reward neutral task they are restless and try to please themselves and achieve a level of understanding. That is a feature of humans which clearly distinguish them from a monkey uh, and the other lower level animals. Okay? The uh, desire to achieve a level of understanding or level of being in control, regardless of whether they receive reward for that understanding. <clears throat> so what does it take? I took, I, I accompanied each one of the bullets here with a simple example taken from everyday life, but I would like to impress you that we are talking about highly complex endeavors here, not as simple as the uh, turning the light switch on. <clears throat> Here are uh, practical cases where are in need of understanding. For instance, how effective a given treatment is to preventing a disease. For instance, a manager can ask, was it the tax breaks that caused our sale to go up or a marketing campaign? Extremely important to be able to uh, decide which department deserves the next budget increase. What is the annual healthcare cost attributed to obesity? It was in the news lately, <clears throat> whether we can even quantify the idea of uh, uh, healthcare costs attributed to obesity. Can hiring records prove an employer guilty of sex discrimination, extremely important in our days when we talk about the fairness of algorithm, fairness implemented in AI system, <clears throat> or even a legislating algorithm, making sure that they are fair. Okay. Question regarding personal decision-making now. Okay. I'm about to quit my job. Will I regret it? 
given that I am about to quit my job, provide some information about pl how pleased I am with my job and whether I will regress. So <clears throat> now notice that I've highlighted in yellow uh, five notions or relationships. And the reason I labeled them, I highlighted them in yellow is number one, they give me the clue that we are dealing here with a new species of computation. I can recognize them from a distance because I trained myself in the past few years to see them in every sentence that I read. <clears throat> and also because they have a special feature. They cannot be articulated in the grammar of ordinary science. Why? They are unarticulated in the standard grammar of science because that standard grammar has been um, handcuffed by a symbol of equality, by equality sign, which is an algebraic equality. If y is equal to ax, then x is equal to y over a. <clears throat> algebraic equalities do not distinguish directionality. <clears throat> and we are dealing here with an asymmetric relationship of cause and effect. It gives you an example. The if x is the atmospheric pressure, we expect the deviation or the deflection of the barometer to be enslaved or to follow the atmospheric pressure. And you and I would agree that it will be uh, unacceptable okay, to say that the atmospheric pressure follows the deviation of the, or the deflection of the barometer. So <clears throat> all these uh, highlighted notions are asymmetric. And um, when we talk cause-effect relationship, we are talking about this asymmetry and we must, uh, we must um, uh, resign to the fact that science has not been gracious to us to provide us with an algebra to handle this asymmetry. So we must invent a new algebra to capture this asymmetry in this important notions that, that um, uh, colors or shape our understanding of the world. Right? In computer science, we do have an operator which can capture that asymmetry. We call it assignment. And I'll show you uh, how <clears throat> we uh, give we in, interpret things in the world in terms of assignment that nature assigns value to other, to uh, variables or to events, okay? Based on the uh, notion of asymmetrical assignment. So we'll go to there, but a little bit of history because I should pay tribute to the first person who noticed that science has not been um, gracious to us and decided to invent a new notation for the asymmetry that we find in nature. And this was Sybil Wright, a geneticist, a geneticist uh, in the 1920s <clears throat> who dealt with the hereditary phenomena of guinea pigs he fell in love with two things, with the guinea pigs and with the causal relationship which he put in path diagrams. <clears throat> what did he do? What did he accomplish? He was concerned with the laws of hereditary of to what degree the fur color of the parents' guinea pigs determine the fur colors of the offsprings, okay? 
And he says, I'm not interested in correlation, he says. I'm interested in the underlying causal mechanism. And correlations are symmetric. And I'm looking for asymmetric relationship. <clears throat> so he put down something what was uh, innovative and revolutionary at the time. He did not perceive that to be revolutionary. He said, that's the way I think. As a geneticist, this is the way I think. I know that the fur color of the parents' guinea pig determine the fur color of the offspring and not the other way around. So I will follow my intuition and my understanding and put down an arrow, an arrow to capture the idea that this relationship is asymmetric. So this was the first time that causation received a mathematical or formal voice. Before that, people taught asymmetrically. You find the asymmetry, you find causal relationship guiding people forth from the ancient Greek, from the ancient Hebrew, um, all over. You cannot have a causal talk, a talk among people without being decorated with causal notions. So obviously um, it shaped their thinking, but it did not receive a formal notation. And we in computer science believe that without uh, notation, you don't have science. I have later a quote from De Morgan who said the same thing about formal logic. Before Bull and De Morgan, he said, uh, formal logic went from one failure to another and has not advanced much in 2000 years. <clears throat> but when Bull came and created an algebra for propositional logic, things took off. And the same thing happened to causation. Before civil right, there wasn't much progress except for discussion of intuition. <clears throat> From civil right on, things took off not as easily as you expect because it was a revolution and civil right was attacked immediately by a statistician of the time. What are you doing? Are you inventing, are you discovering causation from correlation, something that we know it's impossible? And he was uh, heroically defending his position that he's not dis He's not uh, extracting causation from correlation, but he says, I am extracting causation from two things, data plus assumptions which are embedded here in the path diagram. He couldn't pinpoint his assumptions. He didn't know, for, for instance, that the lack of errors is a major assumption, the lack of error from G triple prime to uh, that guinea pig is a major assumption. You could not <clears throat> articulate symbolically the assumption that he made in putting down the intuitive path diagram, but he recognized very strongly that he is making assumptions here that helps him when combined with data, come up with the undoable, namely coming up with a causal entities. These are the coefficients that you find here labeled A, H, and C. These are called path coefficients, which he claimed to the rest of his days heroically that these are causal coefficients and not correlationally defined coefficients. <clears throat> he did not have much success, not even in uh, genetics. People in social science discovered his papers and <clears throat> adapted it to social science and it disappeared from social science. He didn't have much traction in uh, convincing economists that they should uh, use his past diagrams to capture the um, uh, structural equation because he came out with a new grammar. Anyone who comes with a new grammar is being shunned and distant because, because the mind 
<clears throat> follows the language and the notation more than the ideas. So <clears throat> after paying tribute to civil rights, I will tell you what happened since civil rights. Yeah, he is uh, what he the elements that uh, brought us from civil from civil right to the modern causal models are encapsulated in something which I call structural causal model. It's the oracle of all causal statement and it's rooted in human intu intuition, okay? <clears throat> what it is, is the recognition or uh, it's, it's a perspective of the world as a society of listeners. Namely, every, var every variable is assigned a value. You see here I'm using the assignment operator, not the equality sign, assigned a value which is a function of other variables in the domain, V1 up to Vn, plus some noise factor. These are variables that we do not care to put in our model, our choice that we would like to treat as something exogenous, just give it a value with a disturbance term or exogenous variable or noise term, okay? And that is uh, the essence of the oracle, which I'm going to describe to you in a second. It's a society of listeners. <clears throat> Once you have a collection of equations, they determine a graph. A graph is just an abstraction of that collection of equation where you put an arrow between the argument of the function and um, the uh, variables that receives the value. You put an arrow between those uh, variables that affect VI and VI itself. So I have a graph defined by the society. Okay. Now I'm going to show you how elegant this entity SCM structural causal models, M, how elegant it is, how useful and it, how elegant and useful, a combination of two things which allow us to assign values to every causal sentence, a truth value. And this is the first law of counterfactual or the first law of causal inference. <clears throat> I'm going to we talk about two laws. The first one is the law of counterfactuals. <clears throat> it is. I found this on the web. Uh, is there a question? No. No. I heard about uh, somebody should move their mic. Um, oh, no question. Uh, I, I couldn't quite hear the question. No question. No question. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> I call it the first law of causal inference. And look how neatly in one square you put it here. And what does it say? It says if I have a model, namely a collection of functions like that, <clears throat> you can evaluate all counterfactual terms. <clears throat> Let me interpret it. The value of variables y. Had x been small x, Capital symbols will be the names of variables. Small lowercase symbols will be the values attached to them. Now, <clears throat> now I'm going to interpret that in the following way. The value of variables y. Had x been small x, okay, for individual u or under the exogenous variables u is equal to the solution of Y in a mutilated model in which we remove, we mutilated, we remove the equation for X and replace it by constant X. 
So that is interpretation which tells you how to assign a value to every counterfactual. I'll show you some examples in a second. But first I want just to show you the second law. And from this two law, everything that I'm going to talk about follows. So you wouldn't need me next year if you want to do, if you want to exercise any uh, task in causal analysis. Everything follows from these two. This is a law of conditional independence, also called different de-separation. It tells you that every time you find separation in the graph, it implies a conditional independence in the data. With, okay, I'm going to show you some examples. But uh, <clears throat> by the way, this follows from the first law, but it's nice to display it separately because it's something which is uh, not easy to prove. Okay. Let's look at uh, the working of this uh, first law. What does it tell us? It tells us that if I want to find, for instance, the value that y will attain had x been small x, all I have to do is to take my model of the universe, my oracle, okay, remove the equation that previously determined x, replace it by constant x is equal to small x, okay, and solve for y. This value that previously was y now becomes y sub x. This is the value that y would attain had x been small x. It's extremely simple. See, everybody knows how to solve equations. Even high school kids know how to solve equations, which means high school kids are experts in counterfactual, and they are. What else allows them to solve uh, questions in uh, elementary physics? Counterfactuals, because they're being asked questions like, what if the weight of the spring were three or 26? They are able to think counterfactually and replace the weight from three to 26 and resolve the problem. It's a little bit, little bit hard for a computer if we didn't equip the computer with that schemes of erasing equations, replacing them by constant and recalculating the value of y. That's all that it says here and I, would like to I summarize this slide by saying that counterfactuals are embarrassingly simple. If they weren't embarrassingly simple, we wouldn't use counterfactual in the language. And we do use it. Look, from, from Abraham to uh, Eratosthenes, okay, that asked the question, what if there were not 50 righteous people in Sodom? Okay. Can, what if Cleopatra knows was differently? What if you didn't smoke for five years? Okay. We do com communicate and we reach consensus in this communication. So it must be simple. And here I'm going to propose to you why it is so simple. It's nothing more than solving a, a bunch of equations in a mutilated model. I will go now to the next and tell you that the same thing applies to intervention. What is intervention? Intervention is a special kind of counterfactual. Look at that. Probability that y sub x will be equal to small y. Okay. Probability that had x been small x, okay. if I were to smoke, then my life expectancy would be small y, five years. Okay? But look, it's under a p. It's a probability that my life expectancy will be five years. It's, it differs from the counterfactual in the sense that it's under the probability, probability sign and not under the individual sign, not the value the actual value of the variables, but the probability of that variable. Because it has this unique 
properties, we invent an operator called do x, and we are dealing with the do expression like this. Why it is important? Some people do not think it's important. It's important for practical reasons. We would like to distinguish things that we can um, infer from randomized experiments, from controlled experiments, and things which, re which require extra information that you couldn't get from randomized experiments. Therefore, we invent this uh, symbol do, and that uh, characterizes all the properties that we can get from randomized experiments and distinguish them from other counterfactuals that in general need additional information. So now that brings me to the ladder of causation, which is not something that uh, I propose, but uh, my, my opinion, but it's coming from this definition of counterfactual. It's coming automatically and we observe that we have here a hierarchy that goes from association to intervention to counterfactuals. And it's a hierarchy in the sense that you cannot answer equations, eh, you cannot answer questions at level I unless you have information from level I or higher. So if you have a facility uh, to um, intervene on the world, you can answer a question both in uh, both interventional kind of question and associational question, but you cannot go the other way around. If you only have correlation, you cannot climb up to rank number two and answer interventional questions. Okay? If you only have interventional facilities in the world and you don't have the imagination that comes with the SCM, then you cannot answer counterfactual question. You cannot answer questions such as, what if I've done things differently? Or why, why a certain event happened? Was it X that caused Y? What if X had not occurred? Undoing event. What if I had acted differently? These questions cannot be answered if all you have is intervention on the world, okay? If you let um, a, a baby or a monkey play around with things without the ability to store information of the counterfactual type, you wouldn't be able to answer questions that require imagination. And the imagination is what I attribute the um, acceleration that we saw in the development of science acceleration on the evolutionary scale, scale that brought us from a caveman to the scientific revolution that we see today. I usually use the analogy with the um, snakes and owls that have developed a very keen um, vision, vision system, <clears throat> but never be able to invent an eyeglass or microscope as we have done in the past only few hundred years. Okay. It took the hours millions of years to develop its vision system. And it took us only 500 years to develop the science of optics. So we are in AI, we are after level three. From level three, you can get all the rest, but it's not easy to climb the ladder from level to level. There are barriers, barriers which are not appreciated in many fields. In some fields, even the climb from association to intervention is being doubted. Many of the machine learning people think they can climb this barrier from number one to number two by just being smarter with the data. But this ladder tells you no matter how smart you are, you need something extra to climb this ladder. This is the ability to actually 
intervene on the world. Okay? And the same thing from level two to level three, even some epidemiologists uh, do not believe that you need to, um, to, to distinguish them in a special notation. But <clears throat> so I don't want to drag you into the um, disputation that I am involved with this field. I would just like to convince you that we have here a meaningful barrier that need a push for climate. Okay. Let me now explain to you in greater details how to work with the second law. The second law is the law of uh, independence. How to read independencies on the, in the model. Oh, you could do that. Yeah. In your second law, you had a D separation. What's D? Say it again. Originally, in your second law, you had a yeah. D. What, what was D? Ah, D stands for directional. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. Sorry, yeah, that was a part of a, a long tradition. Uh, where is, did I say, where do you see the D? In the first uh, slide. It will be. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 now I'm, I'm just saying it quickly, separation. But what I mean is this separation in the literature, it came from directional separation. It's not separation in undirected graph. It's separation that takes care of the directionality of the arrows. Okay. It is about three decades long notation or even four decades because the Bayesian network were uh, uh, formulated in about 1985, and we needed a word, a notation to distinguish separation in undirected graph and separation in directed graph. Okay. So, yeah, so it's this separation, right. So <clears throat> imagine that you have here the structural equation model, it's a bunch of equations, okay, and um, this is a graph that corresponds to that. As you can see, these are the variables that receive arrows or that are arguments of other equations. So we, the graph follows the collection of equations. That's very simple abstraction. Right. Now that you have the graph, how do you read independency in the data? Every time you have a missing arrow, it advertises a conditional independence because a missing arrow in the graph advertising uh, advertises a separation. For instance, okay, I'll go right, I'll go quickly here. Here's a missing arrow. Okay. <clears throat> it makes C be separated from W given S and R. Okay. A missing arrow means a separation. And the separation tells you which variables will be independent in the data. So here we have <clears throat> S and R separating C and W. It tells me that C is independent of W given S and R in the data. There is a little twist here, a missing arrow between S and R. It tells me that S is separated from R given C and W, but here's the collider. It has its own rule. I wouldn't get into it. It's a technical detail of how to handle collider. I know it, if I know the rules, it tells me that S and R are independent given C, not given C and W. It's just a little technical detail of how to handle uh, colliders that head to head arrows, okay. But let's go back and ask ourselves, okay, why I call it a miracle. Because look how audacious this theorem is. It says that if the use are independent, I don't show the use here, I just imagine them to impinge on every, every variable has its noise factor, noise factor, noise factor, UC, US, UR, UW, it tells me 
that as long as the U's are independent, the observed distribution, namely P of C, R, S, and W, must satisfy the constraints, and these constraints are independent on the nature of the functions here, no matter how crazy function you load it with, and no matter what the probability distribution that you attribute to the impinging noise, okay, these independents are going to be expected to hold in the distribution, if your model is correct, of course, right? <clears throat> and they are readable from the graph. It takes about uh, five minutes to computer scientists to learn it. It takes uh, 50 years for an economist to learn it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> this is, this is the world we live in, okay? Um, <clears throat> but it's such a useful device that without which, it, it's so useful that I labeled the second law. Okay. And it's, it's a miracle that we have this, uh, why? Because we can do so much with that. What can we do with that? Applications, model testing. If the data turns out not to satisfy the conditional independencies that the model dictates, which means that something is wrong with my model. So I can test the model and overrule it and uh, discard it and repair it. Okay. Number two, what I can do is structure learn. I can think about the set of all models that are compatible with the data I do observe or with the conditional independencies that I do observe in my data. And I look at a set of compatible models and I can uh, perhaps find a nice parsimonious representation for the set. And I can ask question about the set rather than individual model. And sometimes the answer that I get from the set will be satisfactory and sufficient for the kind of question I want to answer. And this is the idea of structural learning, which is one of the pillars of wisdom. Third, I, can I will show you soon that I can use interventional question to statistical adjustment using the correlation that I found in the data. And more important for us is reducing intervention question to symbolic calculus. And that is the function of a, the do calculus, which allows you to answer question about intervention just by an analytically, like, like, like in algebra, like solving equations in algebra, or like doing a integration, symbolic integration. Okay, let's, we are ready to go into the do calculus and look at one of the working holes of this uh, exercise, and this is the backdoor criterion, okay? It tells you that <clears throat> if you want to find the causal effect of an action, do x on y, it, it is estimable whenever you find a set of variables z that uh, blocks all the path, all the backdoor path between the X and the Y, okay? Why is that? Because <clears throat> what does it mean if I do X? I mean, if I chop off the equation or the arrows going from X parents to X, and I look at the, my remaining graph, I can accomplish the same thing by blocking the spurious correlation path along these arrows from X to Y. All the spurious and non-causal um, path from X to Y, if I chop them, if I block them by adjusting, by observation, I can accomplish the same thing. So therefore, I look at my graph and say, what if I observe Z1 and Z4? I can look at whether or not I have managed 
to block all the spurious correlation between X and Y or not? If I do, I say yes. The causal effect is estimable by simple adjustment. So I can do with S from Z4 and Z5. And so I can tell just by looking at the graph, which covariates I need to adjust for if I need to estimate a causal effect. So without doing any, without doing any physical intervention, I can look at the graph and say, I can simulate intervention by simple statistical adjustment and give you the answer that you would have gotten had you run a controlled rise, control randomized experiment on X. Okay. Here is an example in more, oh, and what, what the answer? Here's the answer. The answer to my question, what Y would be had I done X would be a do free expression, no do, no intervention. It just has conditional probabilities in it. I, I condition on Z and I sum, I took a weighted sum given the prior probability on Z. These are available to me from for my data, right? The probability of Z and the conditional probability of any variable on any set of variables is available to me in the data. I can compute it. Therefore, I can infer an interventional expression from a statistical expression using this technique. It's called adjusting for Z. This is something that was an obstacle to statistician from the time, from the time of Fisher. Yes. And uh, the question of which, which confounders you should adjust for to deconfound your system has been a stumbling block for many years and it received a full uh, formulation now using this simple idea of de-separation of backdoor criteria. Okay. <clears throat> In more practical application, I'll give you an example from, uh, from uh, um, medical, uh, from sport medicine, okay? In sport medicine, the question of whether warm-up exercise causes injury or prevent injury is still debatable. Okay. And you have many, if you ask a sports physician, what are the factors that uh, are, comes to mind? He or she will plot this kind of network. So here you have here the question is, <clears throat> what should I measure? Some of them are very hard to measure. Some of them are easy. Some of them, if you measure them and you incorporate them, you'll get the wrong result or biased result. The answer is simple. Just look at the graph and you get the answer. If you, if you manage to measure Z1 and Z2, you are done. If you manage to measure intra-game proprioception and Z1, you are done. It's okay. Thou shall not adjust for previous injury. No, no, it is a collider which will give you a wrong result and so on. So it all boils down to uh, mathematics. It's no longer at the mercy of human intuition, which was until the uh, cause of revolution. Now it becomes a matter of mathematics. You take your intuition, you consult it, this is your scientific knowledge of a domain, but you're putting down the way you present it in your mind. Okay, easy. The way you, that comes to your mind. Now you propose it to the mathematics department. You send it over and ask them, what shall I do? And the rest is formal analysis, 
no longer rely on intuition. Okay, I want to show you how you go beyond adjustment. Here's an example <clears throat> of a domain and a problem that cannot be solved by adjustment. We, it's a famous problem of smoking, tau, and cancer. <clears throat> Suppose we are given a possibility of measuring the tar accumulated in the lung of a patient, whether or not the patient smoked, whether or how long it took to develop cancer. Okay? So we have information only about the three variables, smoking, tar, and cancer. And we suspect, however, that there is a genotype which is unobserved, which make people crave for nicotine, at the same time puts them in a cancer risk. Yeah. So this is the unobserved genotype problem that Fisher argue must exist and we shouldn't rely on the, the, on the correlation that we observe between smoking and cancer. And the question is, how can we solve a, a problem like that? And there's no variables that we can adjust for that will comply with the demand of the, of the backdoor criterion. Okay. There is no such a, a variable T or Z that if I adjust for, will block all the backdoor path between smoking and cancer. Here is a backdoor path that is not blockable because it goes through an unobserved hidden variable. <clears throat> but it can be done by pure algebra. Here is uh, how the algebra goes. I'm going to give you only the flavor, not the detail. The flavor goes like that. This is my query, you see? P of cancer, given that I do smoking or I do not smoking. This is my query. Okay? And I want, what is my input? The data gives me the probability of three variables, okay? joint probability of three variables. I want to be able to answer the query using my data. Namely, I want to <clears throat> be able to convert my data into expression, which is do expression. Or the other way around. I, can, I want to be able to convert my query into expression, which involves only conditional independencies among the, on my, uh, that I can obtain from my data. It's doable this way, okay? I have, uh, again, forgive the details, just, just the flavor. The flavor is that we have rules of uh, combination or rule of transformation that we can transform an expression involving do and see to other such uh, sentences. And the transformation is valid if a certain condition in the graph holds. These are the license givers and I'm going through an exercise in pure logic, can I convert this to this? And the answer is yes. I'll, I'll go one rule by rule and tell you the rule is satisfied given the condition in the graph. And so now I have a, a proof, what we normally in computer science will call a proof, okay, that it's doable and this is the answer that you get. But look at the answer. It has no do operator. I got rid of the do's and I got an answer which contains only conditional probabilities, which I can experiment, I can uh, estimate one by one and multiply in sum. Or I can send it to the machine learning department and ask them, have you ever seen such an expression in your life? Can you perhaps give it to a lasso kind of algorithm that will find a quick and um, unbiased estimate of this kind of entity from finite data 
that's important here, to get the maximum power that you have to minimize variance. <clears throat> the idea is that with the algebra that we have here, we find an expression that emulates our intervention, and we can think about machine learning exercise that will give us an estimate or for this kind of estimand. Estimand is what you wish to estimate. Okay, just to, that is the flavor of the Duke calculus. These are the three rules of the Duke calculus. You can <clears throat> give you a license to ignore an observation, a license to change observation to an action, interchange do z z if something holds in the graph, and a license to ignore action altogether if something holds in the graph. These are the three rules. And it turns out that this uh, calculus is complete, complete in computer science sense. What does it mean? It means that if the algorithm fails to give you an answer, then no one can do better. It means that the answer does not exist, which means that the query is not estimable given the ex the assumption that you have in your model. Okay. And that the model must be refined, that new observation must be taken or new um, links must be uh, invented or new, ob a new intervention must be stipulated. The model must be refined and no one can do better. So no machine learning person can tell you that he or she is smarter and can climb the ladder and give you an answer to your qu uh, interventional query. It's just undoable. And that's very important. Be able to determine that your model is insufficient saves you hours and hours of uh, futile efforts. Okay? The idea, for instance, in the uh, linear in linear algebra, the idea that you cannot solve uh, three equations with four unknown has saved humankind hours and hours of trials, right? It was extremely useful at the time, and this is what is useful in our time. Okay, <clears throat> at this point, I'm going to go to the second part of my agenda. And I'm going to talk about the new, what the new science adds to AI. One by one, we'll tackle those seven pillars of causal wisdom. The first pillar we already seen. To combine, oh, no, sorry. I don't know how I jumped to that. Okay, I have a seven pillars, and I see the slide. The slide here only goes to some of them. Forgive me. Okay, look at the data fusion program. That's one of the tasks that has been <clears throat> a stumbling block, both in machine learning and in many sciences. How to combine results from several experiments or observational studies, each conducted on a different population, and under different set of conditions okay, and come out with an answer so as to construct a valid estimate of effect size in yet a new population and much matched by any of those observed or those studies, okay? I, I will put it in a medical terms in a second, just to show you the complexity of that problem, how important it is and how undoable it is to the human mind. Right? Imagine that you take hospital data from various hospitals. Your job is to find the uh, effect size in Arkansas <clears throat> based on data taking in the hospitals and different areas. You took a study in New York for the survey data <clears throat> And you took a, in Los Angeles, which was on a younger population. You, you got data from another hospital in Boston, 
which was mostly about successful lawyers. This is what Boston is famous for, right? And uh, <clears throat> in San Francisco, it was, uh, you notice post-treatment that patients who were selected for the trial had high, especially high blood pressure. And then you, you also got information from Texas, which was mostly on Spanish speaking subject. And they had high attrition, which means not all of them followed the study. Some of them dropped. This is very much like the problem we had today in the past two years with the COVID-19. We had information from various countries some of, the, of them were careful about the data. Some of them actually manipulated the data for political reasons. Yeah. And <clears throat> the data came from different population under different conditions. And we had to put it all together and come out with a, 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 a answer to a query, what about Spain? Should they be vaccinated or not? <clears throat> well, you can see the enormity of the, of the problem and it's uh, indeed undoable to the human mind, but it's doable if you have the mathematics to do this. So here it is, oh, sorry. I still have more, three more hospitals. <laughs> okay, <laughs> never, never mind. It's complex enough even without those. So forget about the hospitals and let's look at them from a mathematical viewpoint. Zoop, this is what you do if you <clears throat> formalize it and you assume that the disease is essentially, it, it has followed the same structure. It's just the condition change. So this S variable is <clears throat> it's called, uh, I forgot what we call it here. Yeah, it has a name. We just call it S variable. It is selection variable. It tells you how one environment different from another one. If I put an S variable into Z, I say this environment is suspected of having different type of Z's, Z's people than these, or than these. This is a target. So here are different variables receive the alarm variable telling them you might be different. There should be a disparity between the W measured here and the W measured in your target population. It designates where disparity might come from. But the idea of the algebra is to extract the commonalities among them, putting the commonalities together and come up with an answer to the query what can you say about the effect size in Arkansas, which you never visited before? You don't have any data coming from. All you have is stipulated structure. Okay? And the algebra is available. So I'm just telling you a summary of the accomplishment of this study in what we call transportability or fusion. And the summary goes like that. Transportability can be determined provided that commonalities and differences are encoded in selection diagrams, like the one that I showed you before. The S variable is a selection S. Okay? And when it is feasible, you can extract a transport formula that can be derived in polynomial time a transport formula tells you what data to take from what studies and how to put them together to get the answer to the query. Okay? And that's in polynomial time. And again, something else which shouldn't be underappreciated, the algorithm is complete. Which means if the answer, if the, if the algorithm come, comes up with, an, with a failure, I cannot do it, it means that it cannot be done. 
that you don't have enough data or in sufficiently refined studies, something must be done. So this is what we call data fusion. Okay? <clears throat> Selection bias is another exercise within the data fusion uh, um, scheme, but it has to do with the fact that in most <clears throat> trials and in most experimental studies, <clears throat> the people who volunteer for the study are different than the people who are actually going to use the recommendation of the study. Okay. Normally, you entice people to come and volunteer for the study financially. You tell them you are going to get uh, days off work or you are going to be actually incentivized, incentivized by uh, money, real money. Okay. And if you are homeless, you are more likely to volunteer to the study than if you have a good paying job, okay? Which means you have a selection bias in your studies, which cannot be gotten rid of by randomization. Randomization doesn't cure selection studies. You are stuck with it. Okay? I recently, said that we all we all live in a in a selection biased world our universe is select is uh, bias prone because we are not the one who decide what data we look at it's nature that occasionally spits out data at us or enables us to conduct experiments but no we are not the masters of what we want to interrogate in nature. But never mind the philosophy, let's go, let's go down to uh, nitty gritty. <clears throat> Again, it's the same scheme. You put down on paper what you want to find and you put down what you do have, the kind of uh, results you get from your studies, whether it is biased with selection or not. And what you, and, yeah, okay. And, and then you submit it to the algebra and the algebra grinds through and gives you an answer. Is it estimable or not? And if it is, how do you estimate it? So the theorem is that if, you are, if your query is such that you can, no, we can transform it such at all due expression are condition on S and all do free expression are uh, not condition on S, okay. then your query is uh, estimable. And then, then, then you can recover from selection bias, even if such bias exists. Okay. I'll show you an example and why it is. <clears throat> Because you don't want any S, uh, you don't want any S to appear in um, next to a do, okay? Because you don't have information about uh, uh, the people who are selected to the bias. This is not part of your query. You want to query about the, the target population in which <clears throat> no preferential treatment, no preferential selection, took place. So you forbid the S from appearing in the do uh, expression. At the same time, all the do expression should be conditioned on S because this is where you conduct your studies. You conduct your experiment and your intervention on people who volunteered for the study. S is equal to one. So should, the algebra takes care of those considerations and save you all the hard thinking about who was selected, why was it selected and so forth. You just submit it to the algebra, the algebra grind through and give you an answer. Here's an example. Look, here's a model. You want to find <clears throat> the causal effect on the population at large. There's no S here. You have only data given S, which means you're getting, 
study on the homeless people that were selected for the study. Okay. Can you get rid of this? Yes. Two application of the rules of do calculus allows you to accomplish what we said is the condition for the, for recovery. And so how? First one gets rid of the do, replace it by x. The second one supplement this expression with x because it is conditionally independent given z. See, from y, we are done. Two application of the do calculus rules and allow you to satisfy the uh, conditions for recoverability from selection bias. And Zuf, the answer is yes. And here is the answer. Okay, it's not that I leave you without an algorithm. I leave you with the answer. Thou shall take this conditional in, in conditional probability from from the data at large. Multiply it by this conditional probability, which is given to you from the study, combine them that way, and this is your answer. I'm going now to personal medicine, which is another trick. It comes not from it. I didn't list it among the seven pillars because that was uh, it requires counterfactual reasoning. Yeah, it, it, it is part of it, but it didn't emphasize it. Okay. So what is it, is it in personal medicine and what is in all situation-based um, decision-making? <clears throat> Normally, when people tell you, I want to do personalized medicine, what they mean is I want to find a set of characteristics of the individual, and I'm going to look at the subpopulation that resemble the individual the most. Okay. So I'm going to do a study on a population. I call it average treatment effect. It gives you the difference between acting one and acting zero given a set of characteristics C, which resemble the individual in question. This is eight. But that is not what really we are after. We are after the individual itself. We want to find out the probability that the individual will be cured if given a treatment, one, and will suffer or will die, will not be cured if denied treatment, zero, given this characteristic. This is a counterfactual term which cannot be estimated even in randomized controlled trial because it deals with the individual itself. It has the values difference between two kinds of behavior and that they cannot be measured at the same time. I have an end sign here, logical end. I want to have a conjunction here between two events that cannot occur together in the physical world. But luckily, we have a counterfactual logic. The counterfactual logic can supplement what we cannot do in the real world. And we can, bound that quantity, which I call probability of necessary and sufficient. Okay? The treatment was necessary and sufficient for this particular individual. We cannot estimate it, but we can bound it. And sometimes the bounds can be sufficiently informed as to direct your uh, decision better than what you do if you have population data if you base everything on population. And this is what I currently believe is the future of personalized medicine. We have perfected this idea in the past uh, two years into various uh, applications. <clears throat> but you should, we should all understand 
that we cannot with randomized control trial give an answer to this question. Why? Suppose we find there's no effect in the randomized trial. We don't know if no individual was affected or if the treatment cured some and killed others. The difference between no effect on any individual and cure some and kill others cannot be determined from a randomized control trial. It gives you an average on the population, but doesn't give you any idea about individuals. And the logic of counterfactual does give you that additional ingredient. Okay, here's a summary. The probability of necessary insufficient is not in generally identifiable, but can be bound. And the bound can be improved by combination of what? By combining observational and experimental studies. <clears throat> the example will be, uh, I, I'll demonstrate to you <clears throat> for a notion, for a legal notion called but for. Okay. Thou shalt pay compensation in personal liability cases <clears throat> for misconduct or bad the product, if the jury can prove that the, um, the plaintiff would have died, would not have died, had but for the action of the defendant. Okay. Here's an example. Your Honor, my client, Mr. Ed, died because he took, he used his drug so the drug manufacturer is responsible to pay compensation to the family of the disease. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the court is in instructed by the rule of law, I didn't invent it, to decide if, the, if it's more probable than not that Mr. A would be alive but for the drug. This is how the court of law articulate the criterion for guilty or innocent. And now you can see it has two elements. It has a probability element and it has a counterfactual element, but for. How do we articulate it mathematically? Bing, probability of necessity. The guy would be alive had he had no drug given that in fact he is dead and he took the drug. So you can see here why we call it counterfactual. There's a conflict between what we see, he's dead. And here we are asking, would you be alive? Okay. We have a conflict between the condition of between the observation and the query. Okay. If we didn't have counterfactual, the answer will be, come on, it's impossible. But we have counterfactual, so see how we made it. And the court demand that this probability will be greater than 50%, more probable than not. Okay. Well, sometimes we are lucky. And we, by combining observational data with <clears throat> uh, experimental data, we are lucky to have a point estimate for this quantity, which normally is only bound. And here's the case, Hop. oh no, I don't want it, I want, okay. We are lucky enough to have a guilty <clears throat> verdict when the, the bounds happen to be reduced to a point estimate around one. Okay. Combined data can tell us more than each individual alone. And uh, this is only for, certain combination of experimental, um, I, I, I crafted it in such a way so that I'll get a bound of one okay, or a point estimate of one just to be happy with a guilty verdict. Okay? <clears throat> but in, in general, we'll have a bound and if the lower bound is above 50%, then the verdict of guilty should according to the court of law be issued. Good. 
uh, I, I, uh, before we continue, I, uh, I want to uh, read to you some of the questions because we are at the time already that I, I don't want to go away before you answer the questions, okay? Okay, uh, on this part, I'll be, so, uh, yeah, I'll be happy to answer questions on this, yeah. No, it's, it's about the whole talk. It's just that we are at the time where the questions are, uh, I, I'm worried that some people will go away before the questions. Uh, okay. So there, there's a question from Julius von uh, Kugel, again, and he says, uh, I have two questions regarding the latter of causation. So this is, yeah. do you think is this um, as a true discrete hierarchy or rather as a continuous spectrum? For example, where would something like partial identification of counterfactual queries based on observational intervention data fit in? And the second part of the question, do you think the hierarchy is complete, or may there be a need for an additional fourth uh, work? For example, mm -hmm. does something like actual causation fit in with work three? Good question, good question. I'll go to the high. I think that this is the, the, the hierarchy is discrete, okay? Uh, we, we find a very clear um, barrier between the levels. And I don't see how they can be smeared by uh, condition. Uh, what can smear them? Uh, uh, they evolve as a discrete from the structural causal model. I, I, I don't know the mechanism that can make them uh, be uh, continuous. But anyhow, if you have, a, do you, did you have any suggestion of what can make them smooth? Or what can make the transition from one level to, I, I'll go back to the ladder, maybe. It's not too hard. So maybe this is something, uh, yeah. the person who asked the question can actually speak uh, so maybe that's something for me to write to you directly, if you have suggestions. But there's another question here by Issa Kohler, can I, uh, and she says, uh, can data analysis also produce non-causal explanation that gives rise to being in control? For example, a child learns not just that turning the switch on causes the light, uh, switch on causes the light to turn on, but also that the thing on the wall is of the type switch and why. How does that type of understanding fit into the framework? Make a strong case for why AI will not be smart unless it can operate with something like functional causal knowledge, but what about non-causal understanding, e.g. understanding that a particular written text is a contract because of offer, acceptance, and consideration. So Issa is a, from a law school. No, <clears throat> yeah, the, this kind of uh, understanding that we normally find in machine learning, namely understand why the system has given you a yes answer or no answer, why you got the answer, or what made the system produce the answer it did. It's a different kind of understanding that we have in causal reasoning. We are asking for a, a, a why question that relates to the outside world, why the world operates the way it is, Okay, not why the system has been uh, fooled or to uh, give you an answer, yes or no. Why this, the machine learning system has given you an answer is not an explanation. That's an explanation of why the reasoner came out with that recommendation, but it's not an explanation of why uh, you should not receive why your loan application was refused. If yeah, I, 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 I agree that. Uh, the next question is, uh, do you have any examples of transportability and selection bias algorithms being applied to real data in scientific literature? Uh, can you repeat it? Uh, yes. uh, do you have examples of transportability and selection bias algorithms being applied to real data in the scientific literature? Uh, it's a difficult question. I, in my laboratory, we do not, do not do real data, what is called real data. We, we see our job 
as transforming the attitude and the mindset of researchers in other fields, those who are experts in real data. We have been very unsuccessful to convert economists to this way of thinking, but we were very successful to convert the mindset of epidemiologists. Okay. At least somebody counted, there are 200 uh, papers in epidemiology that are using uh, the causal inference here. Okay. <clears throat> uh, actually, uh, I'm not aware of a study with real data, data about the transportability. I'm not aware, but I, I, and I'm not even conducting research because I, I, I don't want to defend myself by so-and-so adapting uh, this system or changing his mind. This is not my criterion for success. My criterion is I can do something today that I could not do yesterday. This is my criteria for success. Whether people <clears throat> fall into it or not, I hope they do. Okay. And, uh, and I hope we'll see more and more transportability kind of uh, exercises done in with real data. But, uh, right now, I don't even know of a single, I cannot name, a, huh, yeah. Okay, I, I can name some exercises in the econo economics that have to do with uh, recovering from selection bias, but they were done wrong. So, I, I, so we have the data and we have the mindset of good people and the time is right to implement it. That's all I can tell you. Excellent. And the rest of the questions are all huge compliments. Saying that great talk, they want to connect with anyone who's applying your work, your work on uh, AI projects or research. And uh, you have a huge following here who wants to connect with you and others. Oh, I exceeded my time. No, I can't do that because I have to talk about the blue sky. Okay, so why don't you uh, <laughs> zoom ahead to the blue sky? Okay, wait, 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 wait. Blue sky. Okay. Oh, okay. That's very important. I, I, it's not blue sky, but it's very important. Because everybody asks me, and what if I don't have a mother? Okay. I, I was educated in machine learning, in statistics, and I believe that everything can be gotten from data. Okay. <clears throat> My answer to that, you should still study structural causal models because in many applications, we can't wait for evolution to take place. <clears throat> the data requirement to go through millions of years of evolution okay, is too sparse. And we have a lot of valuable, valuable knowledge in the skulls of biostatisticians, epidemiologists, that we must bring to bear. So one element is urgency, expediency. We can't wait. Second one, you still have to study SEM. Why? To help you find one if you don't have a model. It's very hard to find a needle in a haystack, but it's doubly hard if you haven't seen a needle before. Right? So I'm giving you about the needle you're looking for. And I have another reason why you should study SM. Once you get it, once you get the knowledge that is needed, if you get it from data or from some tricks, fine. But once you have it, you have to know how to use it. You have to know how to store it so you can answer questions. That's why you have to study SEM. And the fourth one is, don't forget, you have to explain things to a human user. So the explanation that you provide are going to be, must be cast in a language which is meaningful to the end user. And the end user is doing SCM. End user is not using, I mean, is not thinking in terms of neural architecture. The neural architecture is what guides the user inside 
but the language that the user would like to communicate and get an answer in is the language of cause and effect. Okay, I got into it. Now we go to the blue sky. And let me just tell you about social intelligence. This is something you want to capture in the next um, few years. The idea of <clears throat> now we have an understanding of what understanding is. Namely, we have a model of a system that understands a domain. Why shouldn't we use it to find an understanding of a software of another agent. So if we have a blueprint of a software of another agent, we can <clears throat> talk we can talk about one agent understanding another and come out with a definition, an algorithm that will enable them to talk in terms of notions such as trust, desires, responsibility, awareness, intention, motivation. So one agent tells the other, trust me. You, you, you see that I like that I, I understand your desires. I've helped you in the past. I'm going to help you again. I know your values. I know your motivations. Trust me. I proved myself in the past. And that is the what I mean by social intelligence is communication among agents using this notion. I just had, had a look into a Stanford encyclopedia to see what morally responsible is. And look what we find here. There is a causal connection between agent action and the outcome. The agent must have a control over the outcome. Agent must have a knowledge of, be able to consider consequences of an action. It all boils down to notions that we know how to formulate today using the causal models. Freely choose is a hard one. Also knowledge is a hard one because knowing things explicitly is totally different than knowing things implicitly. Okay? I know how to play chess, but I don't know the best first move in chess. Okay, <clears throat> uh, okay so this is the blue sky. I'll end with a statement of the recognition of Gary King that we went through a revolution <clears throat> in the causal inference, which is equal to the sum total of everything that has been learned throughout recorded history. That's a very sweeping kind of uh, uh, statement. And I have complemented with my own statement that this is nothing compared with what you're going to see in the next few years, okay? When we interpret, we realize that we need, the data science is a science of interpreting re reality, not of summarizing data. This is my the end. I like to end with August de Morgan statement that every science that has thriven, has thriven upon its own symbols, not by boring symbols, from other science. And a commercial on the book of why, if you read this book, then I communicate with you. You may teach me, but I cannot, I cannot communicate and being taught by what I need to do next if you haven't read the book of why. Thank you. Okay, I'm ready for question and answers now. Okay, uh, so I, I, I read to you some of the questions. I want to read to you one more comment and then I'll, uh, somebody, uh, people in the audience will ask. So one mm -hmm. more comment is that we need a forum for causal scientists to gather and collaborate. The presentation was awesome and so glad to find other like-minded people. It's time for Kozali to leave the conference of academia and find penetration into every day's business life. Clap, clap, clap. Okay, and now uh, please, uh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, yeah. So first of all, thank you so much. I had high expectations. Yeah, I had high expectations for the, the talk and they're certainly being met. Uh, I had another question on the uh, ladder of ca causation. So my question was, how do you know or prove that animals or, 
or babies, um, their inability to do the, the third level of the ladder isn't just a limitation due to language. Like you can't ask a baby to, to do counterfactuals because they can talk to you. Yeah, or same, same thing with monkeys and other animals. Or is this a stupid question because language perhaps is what enables us to do um, counterfactuals in the first place? It's a good question I don't have an answer for. Uh, it's hard to speculate of what babies do, uh, whether a task performed by babies belongs to each one of the rungs of the ladder. It's very hard, although I know that um, Alison Gopnik has done work on that. Uh, babies um, can do counterfactual playing the game of uh, make-believe. Yeah. Let's make believe that we are playing this game. Uh, let's make believe that you are the king and I'm the queen. Okay. This is a form of counterfactuals and babies evidently do very well in make believe. But <clears throat> I, I don't have the, a, an answer to that question. How do we find out? We need to, to have a better uh, understanding of what task can be performed only if you have the ability to do counterfactuals. Because obviously generating explanation requires a language. Okay. But uh, so the ability to repair things requires counterfactuals. If I turn the, the lights on and the light doesn't turn, if I turn the switch on, the light doesn't turn on I'm thinking about how I can repair it. Perhaps the light bulb needs to be replaced. Okay? So the age at which babies learn that they can repair things by, switch, by t buying a new light bulb and, or thinking maybe there was a power surge okay? and maybe I didn't pay my bill to the department of uh, water and power. Okay? That kind of repairs. It takes, I think, we, we can look to what degree animals can repair unexpected happenings, things that uh, are abnormal, which do not operate according to expectation. Okay. This is one clue that we may have, ability to repair things uh, as an indication that they are engaged in counterfactual reasoning. And I don't think monkey can, Monkeys can repair things to a certain extent, but not the way we do it. Okay. So that's the only one indication. Another one it was to look at the evolution of culture and see whether a different um, uh, development of tools and uh, of tools are accompanied with the development of counterfactual thinking of language of the subjunctive mode in the language. Had he done things? Thank you. Uh, I think there's a last question, um, which is more, more particular. It says that in your smoking and cancer uh, directed uh, graph, um, so the graph you had the arrows flowing from smoking to cancer. What if your model had them going in the other direction? How do you decide which model is more appropriate? Uh, uh, well, I. Everything here is based on your scientific knowledge. Okay. <clears throat> well, there, there are tests. Of course, a model can be ruled out. I, I've shown you incompatibility with the data. There's also incompatibility with a set of experiments. So if you conduct experiments of various kinds, and we know precisely what experiment should rule out what model. But otherwise, when you start, I cannot uh, rule out the idea that uh, cancer caused smoking. But I started with the idea that the cancer, that you have a common, uh, how is it here? In this example, we allowed for some common cause to cause both craving for nicotine and cancer. If you have a feedback loop, that cancer itself makes you depressed and drives you to smoking, 
then you have a feedback loop, right, between cancer and smoking, and you have a cycle. <clears throat> Structural causal model works for cycle as well, as long as you have really one, one uh, equation for variable. So if you have an arrow going from cancer to smoking, smoking still has one set of parents. Let's not confuse, okay. So the SCM in its um, semantic articulation allows for cycles, okay. You cannot use the do calculus to answer the question because the do calculus assume that you have a bag directed as cyclic graph. But you can use, then you have to go back to uh, harder calculus, which I haven't mastered and I haven't developed, which allows cycles and then it goes straight into the structural causal model with the functions there. Okay. I, in my book, Causality, I have uh, two exercises with cycles and answer counterfactual queries with cycles, demand and price controlling each other. Thank you very much. It was an amazing talk. I wish we had more time because I think we missed on some of the slides in, the, in your seven, uh, sort of the seven axioms or seven things uh, that you wanted to describe to us. And um, it gave me a lot to think about, and I think the audience. And thank you for the audience, and especially for you to take the time and this fantastic occasion. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for being with me and for listening so patiently. <laughs> Hey, stop here. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.